If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn it to Nehemiah chapter 10. Uh, for those of you who may not know this, we started a series in Nehemiah earlier in the year before the pandemic, and we preached through chapter 9, and then the pandemic hit, and I thought we probably should adjust our schedule, and we did for a while. But um, the book of Nehemiah really, in a lot of ways, is about uh, sustaining spiritual life through difficult times, right? And we're kind of at that point now. Like, we've been doing this like six months. How long is this going to go for? How long do we have to—how do we sustain ourselves over a longer period of time when things are difficult? The book of Nehemiah is all about that. How do you—how do you experience renewal and sustain renewal over a period of years? I'm not going to read the whole chapter because it's mostly names, which are difficult to pronounce. Um, I'm going to start in verse 38 of chapter 9. In view of all this, we are making a binding agreement, putting in writing, and our leaders, our Levites, and our priests are affixing their seals to it. And then there's a huge list of names of everybody who signed their name onto the seal. The rest of the people, priests, Levites, gatekeepers, musicians, temple servants, and all who separated themselves from the neighboring peoples for the sake of the law of God, together with their wives and all their sons and daughters who were able to understand, all these now join their fellow Israelites and nobles and bind themselves with a curse and an oath to follow the law of God given through Moses, the servant of the Lord, and to obey carefully all the commands, regulations, and decrees of the Lord our God. We promise not to give our daughters in marriage to the peoples around us or take their daughters for our sons. When the neighboring peoples bring merchandise or grain to sell on the Sabbath, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or any of our holy days. Every seventh year, we will forego working the land, and we will cancel all debts. We assume the responsibility for the carrying out the commands to give a third of a shekel each year to the service of the house of our God. For the bread set out at the table, for the regular grain offerings and burnt offerings, for the offerings on the Sabbath and the new moon feasts and the appointed festivals and the holy offerings, for the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and for all the duties of the house of God. We, the priests, the Levites, and the people, have cast lots to determine when each of our families is to bring to the house of our God at set times each year a contribution of wood to burn on the altar of the Lord our God, as is written in the law. We also assume responsibility for bringing to the house of our Lord each year the first fruits of our crops and every fruit of every fruit tree. And as it is also written in the law, we will bring the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle, of our herds and our flocks, to the house of God, to the priests ministering there. Furthermore, we will bring to the storerooms of the house of our God, to the priests, the first of the fruit, first of the ground meal, of our grain offerings, of the fruit of all the trees, and of our new wine and olive oil. And we will bring a tithe of our crops to the Levites, for this is, for it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all the towns where we work. A priest descended from Aaron is to accompany the Levites when they receive the tithes, and the Levites are to bring a tenth of the tithes up to the house of our God into the storeroom of the treasury. The people of Israel, including the Levites, are to bring their contributions of grain, new wine, and olive oil to the storerooms where the articles for the sanctuary and for the ministering of the pre ministering priests, the gatekeepers, and the musicians, we are, are also kept. We will not neglect the house of our God. The issue in chapter 10 in the book of Nehemiah is that a revival has broken out among the people of Israel. They have, they've been living in the land for more than 80 years, and through the leadership of Nehemiah and this priest named Ezra, God has really gotten a hold of their hearts. They rebuilt the wall of the city. They have in their heart to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, the holy city, and to make great the people of God again, right? And so they, re and then they realize that they have not done it, and they have no idea what they're doing. And so they decide to read the Bible. They're like, maybe we should read the Bible. So they read the Bible, and they realize they have really done nothing that they're supposed to do. And so they are really dejected by this. They're like, oh my gosh, God is probably not happy. But they do it on this feast day, the Feast of Trumpets. And so the uh, Nehemiah and the priests say, look, this is not the time to mourn and be sad and repent. This is the time to celebrate. God has designated this day for a celebration. So they celebrate, right? Which is what they're supposed to do, because he says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And then they read the Bible for like a week, and then it's the festival of booths, and so they're not allowed to be sad then either. So they have a whole nother week-long celebration in which you're supposed to read the whole Bible to everybody every seventh year. They hadn't done that for like ah, a few hundred, so they figured that seventh year was up. So they read the whole Bible during the festival of booths, and they learned a ton. In fact, there's five references 
to people listening to the reading of Scripture in those two passages. This whole revival starts with people listening to what God has spoken and shown about himself and responding to it. And, then it, and it gets a hold of them. They're like, we should probably say we're sorry in the most dramatic possible way. And so they do. So, the, so chapter 9, there's this huge um, set of activities of repentance where they repent for a quarter of the day, and then they worship for a quarter of the day, and they do all kind of—they put like dirt on their head, and they wear sackcloth, and they sit on the ground, and they just—they show with their bodies and their actions and their words and their singing and everything they possibly can how sorry they are to God that they have not listened to anything he said or done anything that they were told and expected that he would bless and love them and support them, and yet he has blessed them and loved them and supported them, even though they've done nothing right. And they're like, we, we, would, we would like to respond to all this love by doing what you say. So we're really sorry. Okay, so here's the problem, okay? They've gotten to the end of saying they're really sorry. Now what? They have repented— Negatively, as much as they can, we're sorry for what we did. And they've worshipped. They've said, God, we're so devoted to you. We love you so much, so passionate about what you want to do. Right? Now what? This is a really important question. It's an important religious question. It's an important question for all human beings everywhere doing everything. Right? There's a lot of people who will just tell you people don't change. Not over the long run. What happens when you have a really passionate, devotional feeling that you know is right, and you want to make it permanent? How do you make it permanent? Right? We struggle with this all the time, right? Like, whether it's—for we, we, so some reason, we go to the doctor, something happens, we try on um, pants we used, used to fit, we're like, we get really passionate, we're gonna, we're gonna eat healthier, we're gonna exercise, we're gonna lose weight. Great. That's a great passion. It's a great devotion if you need to do that, right? How are you gonna make that permanent? Or like, you're just a raging machine. Like, you're always saying stuff you shouldn't be saying, and you're hurting people because of it. You don't control your temper. You feel like you can't control your temper, and you want to change. And you're like, God, I know you want me to change. I know you want me to be a temperate person. I, I want to do that. I repent. I believe. I worship. I know you can do this. That's fantastic. How are you going to make that permanent? How are you going to take that emotion? How is it going to become permanent? You want a better relationship? Right? Or you want to be able to start one that's good? Or you want a better relationship with your parents or your children? right? Or you want to build something. You want to do something meaningful, worthwhile, right? You want your work to matter. You want to do something that helps people, right? That takes a while. That doesn't happen in a minute. You tweet something and the world changes. You got to have sustained, disciplined, cooperative work over time, through errors, based on integrity and character. It just doesn't happen. How are you going to make that desire to change the world, or whatever that means, hopefully just to change the experience of a couple of your neighbors? Let's start there, right? How are you going to make that permanent? And then spiritually speaking, or like maybe your life is just a mess. Your desk is a mess. Your closet is a mess. The floor of your bedroom is a mess. Your kitchen is a mess. Your life is disordered. And you realize that that is creating problems. And you want your life to be ordered. You're like, I need to, I need to get it together. I need to sort myself out. All right, great. You can clean everything up today. What's it going to look like in a month? How are you going to make that devotion, that passion, permanent? And far more important than any of those things, even though those are all very important things and part of the work of the stewardship of our very lives, but even more important than that, when you realize you need to repent to God and you want to serve Him and love Him and have your life ordered and you want to be like Jesus and you want to look like Jesus in how you live and act and speak and love, that's great. That's a great devotion. I'm so glad you've repented and believed and that you have a, you have a fire in your heart. How are you going to make that permanent? It doesn't just happen. Now, some people, especially the young, want to believe that the passion will carry you into the habit. They're like, if you really believe enough, if you love that person enough, your marriage will work for 50 years. If you really want enough to change, you really— And so you think when you keep failing, you think you just, like, didn't believe enough. Or somebody in your life said they really wanted to do something. You're like, they're so passionate about it. And you're like, we'll see, right? And then two weeks later, they just completely fail. They're not doing it, right? And you're like, stupid person. They didn't really believe. They didn't really want to do it. They weren't, pa they weren't really passionate about it. It wasn't authentic. No. No, the problem is they're a human being. That's the problem. And human beings have a very hard time converting real, right desires and passions into realities in their character and their habits and their integrity. In everything, especially spiritually. Because we live in such an immediate, materialistic world 
that is always getting our attention and to turn ourselves to ultimate and spiritual and godly things is really difficult for us. Right? So how do you make it permanent? What is the intervening, intervening step, step between a passion and a habit, right? And all through the Bible, if you look at this again and again, God, God is doing this. And let me give you like the institutional way to say this first. They're relatively non-religious. God gives contractual commitments in formative institutions to make human devotion permanent. Okay? <laughs> right? That doesn't sound very sexy, does it? Like you're not gonna, like you're like, we should write a pop song about that. Right? That's, that's fun. Okay, listen. Almost nothing that matters in human life is exciting. Right? For more than a few seconds. Like, l- good things grow and are tended and are planted. That's one of the reasons why almost all the metaphors in the Bible are agricultural. You gotta wait. You gotta do this thing over and over again, right? A, a more spiritual way to say this would be say this. God gives baptism and membership in the church to harness honest spiritual passion. The end. That was great. Um, if you, if you move through scripture, you'll see God constantly confronting people and calling them to himself to believe in him and to trust him with real passion and real devotion. God is constantly coming in and just like smashing into us in a loving desire to create a moment, right? Charismatics like to call it an encounter with God, right? And it, like a momentary encounter where you realize something that the, the, the people in the South talk about, come to Jesus meeting. You know, we, have, we need to have come to Jesus meeting with John about blah, 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 right? Like a moment where you're like, oh, I get it. And then what God is doing is saying, now I'm going to give you this other thing so you can convert your wake-up moment into a day-long change. Right? And so he creates the people of God, and he gives them the law, and he gives them the tabernacle, and he gives them, he gives them all the, he gives them a priesthood. He gives them an institutional set of things, which is a community in which they're formed, a formational structure. Right? But he also gives them a mark of chosen spiritual belonging and devotion that is permanent. In the Old Testament, that's circumcision. Because you and I need both internal markers that are permanent and external markers that are permanent, right? You need to have, to take a moment and you need to say inside of you, like, this is who I am. This is who I'm going to become. This is who I'm always going to be. And it can't be a momentary thing, and it can't be something you can easily put down. It has to be permanent. And usually what that means for it to be permanent is you need to do something to make it eternally permanent. Throughout the thousands of years of the history of humanity, in all religions, among all peoples, that was usually done by some kind of solemnizing in an oath. Sometimes they'd cut themselves and make them bleed. Sometimes they'd, ha- they'd wrap a little sash around their arms at a wedding. Right? What are weddings? Why do, we do, why do we spend all the money on weddings besides to be self-important? Right? The reason is because other people are witnessing the solemnizing of your oath because you are trying to make a passion permanent. That's what's happening. It's not a piece of paper. The paper symbolizes an oath that you have said that what we have built over the course of our courtship, that we feel at this moment, and that we want desperately, we know these feelings are going to go away, but we are going to sustain this permanently. We are going to take an oath, a spoken but internal marker of the permanence of your choice, and therefore your identity, and therefore the test of your own word and integrity. And then secondly, right, we join an external institution in which we can be formed and in which, we, in which we can cooperate. And also for people who naturally scatter, it's a rallying point. There have been a number of pastors who have said, you know, we shouldn't have church buildings. We just have, like home churches and church online. And like, we, then it'll be cheaper. We won't have to maintain buildings and stuff. And like, and then everybody will like be the church dispersed all the time. We'll do so much more ministry. And listen, I think that is an incredibly good way to think about Christian ministry. If the people doing Christian ministry were angels, right, aside from human nature and people's weakness and their likelihood to scatter and to then get disconnected and be lost and not be shepherded, other than the whole human part of it, that's an incredibly good way. I would love to do ministry like that. Are you kidding me? It'd be so amazing. We wouldn't need a pastor. I wouldn't even have to do this. We'd all just naturally be Christians. We wouldn't even need a church. We just all individually love Jesus and come together when we felt like it, like in a little, like, flash mob in the mall or something, you know, but that's it. But that's not what human beings are. We are creatures. We're high input, high output creatures. We need a lot. 
We need people supporting us and helping us and doing things for us as we do things for them. We need love and care and commitments and we need to feel secure and we need to know that we're wanted and we need all this stuff. And if we have all that stuff, we can do a lot. We can do so much. And if we cooperate even a little bit, we can do so much together. But out by ourselves, not in some kind of institution of formation, we don't do well. We are the most annoying creatures on planet Earth in terms of maturation. What takes as long to mature as a human being on planet Earth, a living thing? Not a dang thing. Right? I mean, whales can swim like the minute they're born. Right? Even elephants don't take that long. They take a couple of years, and they're like, I think I got this. Give me the keys. Right? Like, my kids, like, my kids are like, I've got teenagers. They're still at my house. They live with me. My youngest kid is seven years old. If she was an elephant, elephant, she'd have like four kids by now. (laughs) You see, on the very first page of the Bible, God creates the first institution of the human family for the creation and nurturing of human beings, a formational community that's an institution that forms human beings. That's what the family is. It's a very lean one, a very small one with just two complementary leaders in which you you can create a human race from that. But then because that unit breaks down and because human beings need to come together on a larger scale across tribes and peoples and languages and cultures, he creates this large, local, yet universal institution called the church. And he creates it as an institution. Yes, it's an organic body of Christ. It's the ecclesia, the called out ones. It's all those other things too. But he institutes the church and creates leadership structures and disciplinary structures and its creed. And he gives it He gives it all these things. He says it's supposed to meet together and worship with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and the Word of God is to be read, and the Word of God is to be declared, and so on. And all those are institutional functions within this environment where we human beings get formed. The problem is, is that in our present culture, most institutions have failed. That's why you hate institutions. They've almost all failed you. And now what's left of institutions tend to be things we stand on to perform rather than that we're a part of and are formed inside of. And so we can see that they're being used. Political parties are like this now. They don't form people in the disciplines of the party. People come in and stand upon them as a platform to scream to the country and promote themselves. And the church needs to be more like the Marines than the Democrats and the Republicans in this sense. It needs to be a place where we get formed. Not where we seek to have, find a place where we can perform, where we can say our thing, where we can be thought important, right? Now, let's look at three things really quickly about how this happens. How does God try to bring about, through these people, this in Nehemiah 10? And the first thing is, is that the leaders lead and the people respond. The leaders lead and the people respond. It starts with the, the leading people, the Levites, the priests, and the governors, the people who have the power and the money and who are in charge of making the decisions. Those people repent and worship God and commit to a different future. And the people follow them. You, it's very difficult to sustain over time a transformational community if the leaders aren't leading it, part of it. If, if, they, if they're like, yeah, let's do that cynically. But it's not in them. It's not in their hearts. You can't, you can't really do it. And the people who aren't leading need to follow. But listen, they need to follow virtuously. Okay? Following is almost as hard as leading. It's not as hard as leading, but it's almost as hard as leading. Because I do that too, right? I don't lead every place I am. I have to follow in a lot of places. And following is important because you have, to, you have to have humility to submit to leadership or you can't do anything together, right? You've got to, like, you've got to give them the benefit of the doubt. You've got to want to work together. You've got you've to not put forward your ideas as the main ideas. You've got to be able to think in other people's metaphors and along other people's lines of thought. There's a lot of ways you have to give and follow and following. But listen— there are other ways in which you, they have to know if they ask you to do something that's wrong, you're going to say no. The leader's got to know that, like, if they step on certain things, the people are going to be like, whoa, there, tiger. I was with you till right then. And now you want to do that, and I, I can't do that. And so, in order to sustain this within an institution, like among a people, there have to be leaders— You can't get rid of hierarchy entirely. You can make a flatter institution. There's no such thing as a flat institution that's doing anything or going anywhere. Okay? The leaders have to lead with integrity 
and people have to follow with virtue. If that's present, you can do a lot. If it's not present, either one, the leaders don't have integrity or the people don't follow with virtue, it will fall apart. It's hard enough if you've got both of those. Second thing is that everyone needs to take an oath of godliness. Now, obviously not literally everybody in the Nehemiah's day took the oath of godliness. But man, it was a lot of people. It was all the priests. It was all the Levites. And it said everybody else who was willing to separate themselves from the peoples, meaning to separate themselves from the lifestyle and the actions of the people that were not submitted to the law of God and to be part of God's people. Uh, there's a lot of ways in which I think we should be as like our neighbors as possible. I don't think we should be weird on purpose, right? But you, you have to remember that you're following a Savior that explicitly said, um, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. Like, there's a, there's a certain cost that everybody has to count that's fundamental to Christian faith. You have to be ready to be disliked, rejected, and hated by the world. That is, those who won't separate themselves to God. You, you, you don't get to be mean about it. You don't get to attack them. You don't get to punish them and punch them for it. In your heart, you have to, as it says in um, 1 Peter 3, set apart Christ as Lord. One of the things that you can see in this is that they say, um, we are going to obey every command. We're going to observe everyone that we're going to know them. We're not going to be ignorant of what God said, and we're going to do them. Every single one. Why every single one? That's kind of extremist, isn't it? Like, ugh, it makes you feel kind of icky. I mean, not really. Um, obedience to someone who is Lord requires 100% obedience, or it really is zero. The minute you take 1% to your own decision, who's making the decisions on what you obey and what you don't? You are. Right? Like, disobedience can be not just outright rejection. In the scriptures, God counts disobedience as outright rejection, delayed obedience, and partial obedience. Those are all just disobedience to God. And so if you— if you want to say, okay, if you have a passion to be like Jesus, if you want to follow him, if you've repented of your sins and you've turned to mercy, you're like, God, I want to be yours. Listen, you can't allow in your mind, in your heart, any space that says, but I'm going to do this. But no, this is mine. I'm not going to do that one. And one of the ways that's really clear is they go beyond just saying, God, I'm going to do every one, and they confess four explicit commands that they are most likely to disobey. That's a really good thing to do. It's a really good thing to do. You tell God, God, I'm going to obey everything especially these four, which I am most likely not to do, <laughs> right? Intermarriage with non-believers, right? And then a bunch of financial ones, a bunch of financial gain ones, right? Buying and selling on the Sabbath, working other people and, and not taking that day off, not resting, right? And then the other two are financial, that we, we won't work the land the seventh year. We'll let the land rest, and we will rest, and that we will cancel all debts. The Bible said at the end of seven years, any debts that were outstanding had to be canceled. Well, who wants to do that if you're the debt holder? <laughs> Nobody. And yet, they realized, listen, we don't want to rest. We want to just work and have the right to be as prosperous as we can make ourselves. We want to marry whoever we want. How dare you tell us who I can sleep with and who I can marry and who I can have family with God, right? And— um, why would you give me commands that controlled my financial prosperity, right? Those sound like areas where you can just be like, I'll, I'll handle this. No, you won't handle that. No, those are the three areas we're most likely to hold our own counsel, and you must not. And those, those aren't much different. In fact, the intermarriage one is the one most explicitly taken directly into the New Testament. I told somebody just yesterday, they were, who, who was, he, he was dating a girl who's just not a Christian, and, and, he, and I was like, why, why, I mean, I don't need to be like petty or anything, but why, why are you dating her? He's like, oh, and he gave me some reasons. I was like, and he, he, he's like, is that, do you have to marry a Christian? I was like, yeah, it literally says in First Corinthians, the person must belong to the Lord. That's explicit, that if you marry somebody, you must be a believer. And he, he was like, oh, had no idea that was in the Bible. No idea. I mean, in 2 Corinthians, it says, don't yoke yourself to an unbeliever. That is, tie yourself together in union. And that passage is technically about businesses in relationship to lawsuits. But Christians have rightly applied that to marriage because there's no greater, more intimate human bond than marriage. If you can't yoke yourself to an unbeliever in a business arrangement because you'll end up suing each other, you can't yoke yourself together with an unbeliever in marriage. Right? Why? Why? Because... The family is the primary institution of human development. 
And if absolutely fundamental to the development of all human beings is their spiritual development, and if that comes primarily through the family, the family is the first church. It's the most fundamental development of spiritual. And the marriage couple is the most fundamental interrelationship of cooperation in spiritual vibrancy. So the man and the woman, are your wife or your husband, is the person who is the first line of support defense, encouragement, rebuke, love, to help your faith grow and develop, even if they have to fight you for it. Right? And so these people didn't just say, they didn't just take an oath to obey God 100%. They actually explicitly stated the places where they probably wouldn't. And said, God, even in these, we'll obey you 100%. Right? Do you you feel a sense of that oath? And they did it publicly, and they wrote it down, and they said it in front of everybody, and they signed it. Right? Listen, I know people who will leave small groups because a small group does a small group covenant that says, we'll try to get here most weeks. <laughs> and they're like, I'm not doing that. That's controlling. Right? And listen, that kind of stuff can be done in a controlling way. Like, I get that. But our unwillingness to make pre-commitments— to who we choose to be in our integrity, it's a problem. And one of the most famous books written on human habit, like how people change, by a secular person, not a Christian, said the number one thing that leads us to form new habits is predecision. Deciding beforehand, saying it publicly, telling other people, this is what I'm going to do. This is who I'm going to be, and therefore this is what I'm going to do. Right? I remember when we instituted that in my house, my wife and I confessed to each other we would not eat after 8 o'clock. It's really annoying when you go to get a mochi at like 9.12, And your spouse is like, isn't it after eight? And you're like, yes, because I'm a person who doesn't eat after eight. Thank you for reminding me of my identity. (laughs) But it has to be done, or I won't be that person. Right? That's the verse connected to this. Um, In the New Testament, the oath that we make is not really to each other. Right? It says actually in the book of James that making oaths to each other about what we will and won't do is not the way to go. I'll, you can ask about that and then ask me anything after the sermon if you want. But in, in this passage, it says that baptism, that is believing in Jesus and submitting to baptism, baptism is the pledge of a good conscience towards God. That we have received his good conscience, and it's a pledge to walk in that good conscience. And it says, because of that, baptism saves you. Okay? Now, most people in our theological tradition would not say baptism like literally saves you. Because it does say right after that, mm, towards good conscience, it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. So people in the Protestant tradition would say, yes, baptism saves you in the sense that it is through baptism that you receive the heritage of justification, the death of Christ, and the resurrection of the Christ, which is what ultimately saves you. And so baptism and the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, which saves you, are bound together in ritual oath, right? But what that means is this. So so we tend to say, but the baptism doesn't save you. I mean, like, when you accept Jesus, that saves you. Okay, wait a second. Why didn't Jesus say, listen, if you believe in me, I want you to say a sinner's prayer and trust me in your heart and you'll be saved. Right? Now, it does say in the Bible to believe in Jesus in your heart and confess him, and you'll be saved, right? But then it demands of everybody that they be baptized. Why? And it's a demand. It's not a suggestion. In the New Testament, the New Testament doesn't know anything about an unbaptized Christian. Why? Because people in the past used to understand that the oath is fundamental to the continuation and the perseverance. It's fundamental to the change in your personality and your identity. Pledging yourself— Because listen, I can preach an amazing sermon, and you might like feel God's presence, and you'd be like, I'm going to believe in Jesus. I'd be like, listen, believe in Jesus right now. You're like, okay. And you're like, and you know it's right, and you feel it strongly. You're like, I believe in Jesus. Awesome. In two weeks, when all that's worn off, and you've thought about how your friends are going to think about it. And you've thought about what this will do in your family. And you've thought about how it can affect your career. And you've thought about how it will affect your finances. And you've thought about how it will affect your sex life. And you've thought about all of that. Will you get into that tank in that state of mind, knowing what it costs, and take the oath? 
There are an awful lot of people who have said the thing in the moment of passion and meant it, meant it truly, authentically, passionately. But they weren't willing to make the statement when it wore off, when the feeling wasn't there. It hadn't entered their will, their devotion, truly. It hadn't entered their heart in the fullest sense. So they wouldn't take the oath. But Jesus thinks you need the oath. And he actually calls it part of your salvation. Does baptism literally save you, like justify you? No. But is it necessary for salvation? Ah, it depends on what you mean by necessary. It is fundamental to the development of your perseverance. And Scripture seems to teach that perseverance is necessary to salvation, or you weren't really converted in the first place. Okay, last point, since we're out of time. All right. Um, everyone covenants to make the institution great. To make God's institution great. You, the last verse is everybody's like, I'll bring the wood, and we're going to bring the animals, and we'll bring the first fruits, and we'll never hold back. We will not neglect the house of our God. See, they understood that the temple, though they didn't even live near it, they lived out in the towns, they understood that the temple stood for something, and that institution's thriving mattered for them and their children and their children's children. They understood that. Because they understood how humans developed and how they rallied to each other and how they need a place to worship God together and that they have certain rituals that they do together and they need to do them together. One of the reasons, for example, we've had church, like live church with people in this room during COVID is because part of the Christian thinking through something like a pandemic is you have to, you have to think through like people getting sick and what that means for hospitalizations and all that stuff. That's all important to think about. But one of the things we also think about as Christians is what a human being is, how important it is for them to rally to each other to support each other, to help each other emotionally and spiritually, to speak the truth to each other in the presence of each other, to worship God together in the same room, and to feed off of each other's will and passion and devotion towards God. And th those human dynamics are fundamental to not only our survival, but our thriving. And so the reason why you have to sit in here with your masks on and separated and stuff like that, but we're still here and we're trying to do that, is because we recognize the importance of the institution and its functions in our salvation in our discipleship, in our transformation, in our living out of our oaths. Because we are the sort of creatures that have to rally. We're the sort of creatures that develop over time. We're the sort of high input, high output creatures that need this sort of thing. Same reason, you're, same reason people who don't go to church are sitting in driveways and lawn chairs and talking to each other and drinking bourbon, right? They need each other. They realize they need each other. They wouldn't say it quite this way. But they realize it's a fundamentally human thing. But we are fundamentally human and we are trying to turn our eyes not just to the material reality in front of us, but to turn our eyes to God, which is significantly more difficult. And we need each other and the institutional actions we do together, like worship and preaching and reading scripture, to help do it. Okay, let's end with, quickly with, um, I put that in there because you can read it later if you want. It's a quote about this. So what do we, what do, we do with this? Like what's, what's the, um, how do we apply this? And so, um, here are a couple of primers. I always say this about application. I'm not telling you the applications, right? I'm like the little primer you push the ga gas in the engine so that you can fire up the engine of application yourself, right? There's four things I can think of. The first is, is that Jesus is the great incorruptible leader, oath, and priest. Jesus is not, not us. Like in this book, Nehemiah is the leader. There's priests and Levites, and there's, there's an oath, and none of that holds. Nehemiah doesn't fail morally, but he goes back to Susa because he has responsibilities in the Babylonian kingdom. And he's not there. And while he's not there, everything comes apart. So he's not the perfect leader because he had to leave, right? And then the priests fail. We're going to find out in a couple of chapters that like, there's like pagan stuff being stored in the temple of God when Nehemiah gets back. The, the line of priests and their integrity in leading people to God fails. They took this oath and they didn't fulfill it. And so the oath fails, right? They took the oath and the oath failed. They didn't live up to it, right? And that is true for us. Our leadership fails. Can't, I mean, I've failed you countless times. And some people think I'm a good pastor. There's a lot of even worse pastors. There's all kinds of ways where I have not done everything I could do for your spiritual well-being. And I will fail more and I will fail again. Like, I'm not the perfect governor nor a priest. And our oaths fail all the time. Since your baptism, how many times have you not 100% obeyed God? 
like a number of times. And what you need to understand is this. You're not left to your own strength in this. Jesus is the perfect king. He is the perfect governor. He stands over all of us as Nehemiah. Not me, not the elder board, not the president, not the governor. Jesus is king. He is the one who is the perfect ruler, and he is adjudicating, and he is working among his people to bring about integrity and virtuous following and belief and faith. He is that king, and he is that priest. He is the one wooing us and attracting us and speaking to us and teaching us and giving us his word and drawing us by his spirit and convicting us of his truth. And he is the perfect priest. Not me, not the elders, not any of us as the fellowship of the priesthood of all believers. He is the perfect priest, and he is himself the oath of God. It says in Hebrews 7, it says, There was a priesthood of imperfect men. And then God, in the Psalms, it says this, God swears on oath and will never change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was the king of righteousness and the king of peace in early Genesis, who Jesus fulfills in his death and resurrection as the perfect king of peace, bringing us peace with God through his forgiveness of our sins, through his death and resurrection, and perfect righteousness. He lived perfect humanity, lived it for us and before us so that we can follow him as his disciples. He is the perfect priest. And he was given to us by the oath of God, and God's oath isn't going to fail like ours. Right? Like your oath stinks, and his is amazing, and it will never fail. And so in all of the moments where you feel like this is just going to fail, like they failed, we're going to fail, everything's going to fail, No, it doesn't have to. There's a new king and high priest over the house of God, sworn irrevocably by the oath of God himself. Jesus, the God-man who is the Christ, who is the perfect priest, and he will carry us. He will be present and he will help us. And we are not alone. The second thing is, you need to embrace being a human being. You need the internal oath If you haven't been baptized, you should be baptized. You don't need to make 100,000 promises to God. You need to start with just one. There's just one oath. There's just one oath, and that is, God, I will be 100% yours. Every law, every ordinance is given for my good. Every direction that you've given me is for my profit or for the good of my neighbor. It is for true humanity. I want to be a steward in everything. And here are the places where I'm most prone to disobey you and I want to keep for myself, and I give those to you as well. And every time I fail, I will come back to this oath and I will re Promise it, and I will trust you, the perfect priest, to help me. And you realize you're a human being. You need the oath, and you need the institution. Jesus gave you the local church for your good, not his. Right? And then last, give yourself to make her great. I mean, these people said, we will not neglect the house of our God. The, the organism of the local church, for you and I, for High Point Church, um, there, there is a relationship between how great our family will be, how great our faith will be, how great our generations will be, how great our neighborhoods will be, to how great we want to make this place. Um, in that quote by Chesterton, he said something like this, and I'll end with this. He said, people, he said, think of a bad neighborhood. Right? He said, people, you can look at that na- bad neighborhood and you can say, it's just a bad neighborhood. And if that's the case, you might as well slit their throats and move to a nice neighborhood. Or you can say, the neighborhood is just great the way it is. But that's just as bad, because then they'll say just the way it is, which is terrible. What has to happen is somebody needs to arbitrarily love that neighborhood mystically, like a mother loves a child, just because it's hers. My kid's not better than yours, but I think my kid is better than yours. And I, your kid is not less deserving of love than my kids, but I love my kids more than yours. And you know why? Just because they're mine. That's it. Feels arbitrary, doesn't it? They're the ones I got, and they're better than yours to me. Right? And you could say, well, that's just kind of mystical claptrap. It's how everything in the history of the world has become great. Everything that's ever become great in the entire world, somebody loved it, and then worked with all their heart for its greatness, and then it became great. Every time. People believe in the idea of the thing, or they love the thing because it was theirs. Sometimes it was blood and soil. They loved Italy, or they loved Argentina. Sometimes it was an idea. They loved the American experiment, the idea of freedom 
in a new place where you could carve out your own destiny. And sometimes it was mystical and religious. They circled around the temple of Zeus, and they believed that Athens could be great. But for us, it's not. It's around the high priest king who is given by the very oath of God, mystically above us as the spiritual one who is with his church everywhere that it is, but still making it a real thing, a real imperfect human institution doing divine and mystical things, and that we must decide we love her because she is ours, but not arbitrarily. Because my kid didn't love me first. But the one we serve loved us beyond measure first and became our priest and our king through his oath. God, as we take a few minutes right now and we sing songs of worship, just a couple, and as we take a few minutes to ask and think and talk about these things in a QA, and a we pray that you would— um, that you would awaken devotion in our hearts, that you would awaken passion again in us for some things. But I pray that more than that, that you would settle in our will, in, in our contemplation, in, in our choice, that the only way to convert that into permanence is to come to you in the inner meeting thing of being willing to take the internal oath and to be part of the external institution that you have given to form and strengthen and develop us. And we pray that you'd help us to love that to embrace that we're human beings, to embrace that we need these things, and to believe that they will be great because you will make them great and we will give ourselves for them. That as we don't neglect the house of our God, we don't neglect each other, and we don't neglect you. Draw us to yourself, God. You are the end of, you are the end, Jesus, of the divine oath. Holy Spirit, Draw us into the care of the great high priest and governor. We pray in his name.